In the tunnel. In the tunnel. In the tunnel. You're listening to In the Tunnel. Welcome to In the Tunnel, episode number 104. Uh, yeah, we're going to step right into it. So, first things first, we want to talk about the NHL, correct? Yeah. We have... Uh, yep, the season has started. We're going to jump into what's going on, which part of it doesn't make any sense between whose team is actually doing better between Sean and my team. Uh Mostly because I did some statistical research that basically says that your season start is a fluke, but. <laughs> hey, it's a fun fluke. Yeah, enjoy while it lasts. That's the mantra for New York sports. This hey, time. and I mean, these are slightly out of date because Devils won last night. Uh, well, my, my statistical research isn't out of date because it says of like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, aside from the Devils, the big can of worms in the room, uh, right now the Metro is uh, the Devils, uh, Carolina, then the Rangers and Islanders, I think. Uh, it always feels good to be below the Islanders, who have built themselves on having no offense, despite the fact that I don't believe Barry Trotz is there anymore. No, and the, the Islanders are actually scoring pretty well, I think. Yeah, that that's not helping. <laughs> it really isn't. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, Washington, Philadelphia, you are only above Columbus. I mean, I expected to be be- above Columbus. The real thing was, did I expect to be only above Columbus? <laughs> um, and we'll talk... State of the Penguins in a second here, because, you know, uh, yeah, we'll mm. talk that in a second. But what we, you know, we have bought, let's go through, we have what four teams per division that would make the playoffs. We have Boston, yeah, so Buffalo, right now, Tampa Bay and Toronto in the Atlantic. Right now, it's actually so it's technically three and two, right? So three, three, and two wild cards. Uh, but yes, I think it does but work yeah. out to four teams currently. I mean, yeah. Basically, is normally how it works. Um, mm-hmm. Then in the West, we have Dallas, Winnipeg, which is a, a kind of a shocker, I guess, because yep. I don't know what they're building off of up there. Uh, <laughs> Minnesota and Chicago. And if you're Chicago, you you got to stop winning. This, this <laughs> is not the year for you to do that. Yep. Uh, you already are just smacking the cap wall. Um and then in the Pacific, you have Vegas, which I don't think we saw that coming, given how they say goodbye to their players who leave the team the same way that a casino says goodbye to you as you go to the airport. Yeah. Uh, then you have, who else is there? I'm having Seattle reading it. And Seattle. Los Angeles. Uh, in Vegas, Edmonton. Edmonton, Seattle, and Los Angeles. So, I mean, what what's your biggest surprise here? And I, I mean your best surprise. I don't mean the your fact bad that surprise. Seattle is like your, doing pretty your good. Jump. Last night's game they had that's not in these standings. They did pretty good. Um, Vegas, I, I I wouldn't say Vegas is a surprise. I do think they get off to hotter starts. Uh, well, my thing with Vegas is. Didn't they kind of make a lot of moves over the off season that kind of suggested that they were about to start over? No, I think it was more of you know their hot start and how they got players catching up with them. Okay. Um, but at the same time, like they did get Eichel, right? Okay. Yeah. That's I I, true. I don't think you can get Eichel and not be at least decent. See. 
and this has very little to do with actual gameplay, but what told me that they probably were in a rebuild was when I was uh, going through videos yesterday on Facebook, I want to say, and they showed up with Lil John trying to teach offensive zone mentality based on shots, 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 shots. <laughs> um, so it was Jack Eichel and a group of otherwise probably unknown uh, yeah. Vegas Knights all having to answer Lil John on what to do once you get past the blue line. Great. Um, That's that normally is the kind of PR thing that you do when yeah you expect nothing. <laughs> but the but at the same time, like with how different the entry into the league was for Vegas and Seattle, I'm actually surprised that Seattle is putting up as good of a showing as they are. Well, and that might not last. I mean, there's plenty of instances I mean, in pro sports the, where the problem is. Or, or at least just because of the difference, right, in how the draft works, you literally have a team, like in Vegas, they were literally given everything correct, to do what they wanted. In correct. Seattle, it was also... more, they were at the bottom of the barrel already. Now, I'm not saying that, that they, they have a legit shot at making the playoffs, I think, and it's not like a fringe chance. I think they could make it. I mean, they're not going to win the division, I don't think. But now, Correct me if I'm wrong, though. Did Vegas hold on to any, like, really high picks No. when they did? They, they traded away their picks. I thought they kept the their... Round. Well, Maybe the draft class itself for their first rounder yeah, wasn't very good. wasn't very good. Whereas Seattle, like, this past year, the top five was supposed to be pretty damn good. But also, like, did you see how the draft went? <laughs> The, All I know is the, the guy, guy who was supposed to go number one went one, four? Three. Three or four. Three or four? To Seattle, actually, right? I'm pretty sure. Right, which, you know, that's what I mean when I say top five heavy is that when your number one consensus guy can go down to three or four, that normally means that the talent pool surrounding it, because it's not like baseball well, where I mean, there's a, a pool allotted. That's true to a sense, but, like, if you looked at the, the picks before him, in reality, because I think he went four to Seattle, because I think the Flyers were above him. Um, okay. But, like, the Devils were never going to pick a forward. It was just not going to happen. So, or at least definitely not a center. So, you know the second pick wasn't going to pick him. So, once Montreal went over him, which was kind of a surprise to most people, he was immediately slipping down to three. Mm-hmm. See, in the, like, let's not get too far into draft talk, but, like, in theory, there is always that, well, take the best player available thing yeah. and hold them as trade bait. Uh -huh. And that makes me think, like, you know, a team like Montreal could have potentially offered a package to ensure that their guy was there. But True. Then, then a team like Seattle acquires more draft capital and then, say, has two top ten picks. But at the same time, if Montreal didn't pick who they did, the Devils were picking him second. Okay. In that scenario, right? In the real world scenario, that did happen. But I do get you, and I agree. Anyway, let's talk here and now, though. Um, yeah. I don't... It, it's early, and team-wise is always... Because we know this. We know that hockey is the sport where luck factors into success the most. This scientifically proven. Um, I mean, I think, like, see, with hockey, though, like, sure, you have luck. But at the same time, right, like, you still need a well-rounded team, right? Like, otherwise, Edmonton would be at the top of the standings every year. Because they have the best player, but Edmonton was in the big in the top of the, their standing at least last year, and it shows to me nothing. Um, True, Edmonton, but they have they like have the balance. Yeah, exactly. But like, it, the point is that like it would be undisputed if there was no skill involved through the whole team, like skill separation, right? Because they have 
in theory, the best player. But at the same time, there is luck because a bounce decides a game. Uh, the way a puck deflects, the way anything happens, like one small thing snowballs the whole game. And I agree. But I wouldn't say that like it's any more drastic than other major sports. Okay. I mean, so uh, let's get back to the initial question then. Um, is there any true surprise here in a good way? We, we obviously know that there are teams like my Penguins who are a surprise in a bad way, but, you know, I'm looking for other areas to address. I mean, so again, like, I think Seattle's a surprise in a good way. And aside from that, the Devils. um, And I, I really don't like, I don't know, the rest of the Western Conference, aside from Seattle, I don't think is a surprise. Okay. But in the case of the Devils and uh, Seattle, is it sustained? Is it going to sustain itself over the course of 82 games? Or, I, or, don't I, know see, you're a realistic fan. I don't see the Devils winning the division. Does that mean... Uh, I see... I think they make the they can make the playoffs, especially 11 games. Do they, make a, do they have the potential of making a second round? I'm not even going to um, say deep run. Let's just so do it as That success. is conditional, right? Because we already are down Blackwood for I, I don't know what now, right? And uh, pull up. And Palat, right? But Palat, we were showing that if the, the team, other team members can step up, right? Now, Palat would make our team better, no doubt. But Wood stepped up. Bastion has had some good games. Like, w- were you expecting anything from these fourth liners? Probably not, right? Yeah, Wood had a nice uh, move the other night. Yeah, and so I'm not really, like... Unless we start piling more injuries onto our you know, forwards, but there are more of them, right? The, the problem is with Blackwood getting injured, um, he like pulled a muscle, probably like pulled something or popped something out. I don't know. I didn't actually look at the, uh, any of the news around that. But Vanishek is a good goalie, but who's going to back him if Blackwood's injury is more severe than we think? And, like, the whole season was basically riding on the fact that we have, like, a 1A, 1B type of situation where you can have a, what, a 45-30 something split or a 50-30 split. Probably closer to 45-30, whatever it is. (laughs) And uh, if Blackwood's not, and then, because we also have, what, like, we LTIR Bernier? I don't remember. We LTIR some goalie. So, like. You know, it's not a good sign when Bernier's on your roster, though. <laughs> yeah, you but, know that. But, like, the point is that, like, I'm not worried about really offensive productivity. I think Brad has. Brad just continue wants, is continuing to want to prove himself. He sure and Hughes, like, sure that, like, they are three people who can make plays, and in order for us to win the way we're currently winning, we don't need all of them to technically show up at the same time. We need okay. one of them. Okay. Because we are getting that support from the other lines, the second and third, uh, the third and fourth line. Mm-hmm. So, if our goalie situation stabilizes. I see us doing pretty well, probably like second. Th- I would be surprised, like happily surprised if we we're second in the Metro, but like not like going in as at least third in the Metro is not a pipe dream. I don't think. Not needing a wild card spot to get the playoffs is pretty. I think that should be a realistic goal for the team. Okay, so top three in the division is where you want the Devils to sit. Yes. At the current moment, again, uh, that will change if our goaltending goes down the drain. Oh, yeah. But the way it currently looks, I don't think top three is impossible. I actually think it's pretty realistic. So in what's more realistic, 
you guys sustaining offense to support moderate goaltending yeah. while this happens, or better goaltending to support moderate offense? Because you're scoring or offense We're, so, is not pro- as prolific as other teams. Right, but we are making so like so. The thing is, our offense, while it's impressive, we are making so many more shots than our opponent. Okay, um, which is always a good sign. Like it, the disparity is like uh, since before yesterday's game, it was like forty to twenty-seven in shots per game, like shots allowed versus shots taken. It's a very good margin. That, but that margin, I think, is ridiculous. But if we can, like, half those shots, like, sure, they probably are, like, you know, nitty-gritty on pro- ones that probably weren't going to go in anyway, but at least we are showing that we are, pop- like, pushing pucks towards the net, right? Yes, which is and, always the mantra that I would have for a team. Yeah. I so mean, Seeing quality, ch- quality shots over number of shots makes no sense to me because... It, just as easily stop 92% yeah. percent of quality shots as you do 92% of any shots. Right. So and if you look you might at. Might as well put more shots in. Yeah. Like if you looked at uh, Ryan uh, Graves' goal yesterday, it was a uh, like ridiculous. It just like slowly trickled, trickled through the five hole. Like that shot probably would never go in nine times out of 10, but it did because we just, he just kind of flung it. So the. I think that the way that the team needs to at least maintain this sort of performance in terms of being able to, even down the line, at least being able to squeak out a point, like if we we're playing Calgary next, right? If we're able to squeak out a point, it's continuing that way because we're taking a lot of pressure off our goaltending by not allowing the shots on the reverse side. Mm-hmm. And... I mean, I hope it gets better, but their save percentage isn't really that great. Yeah. I mean, it's a different story for my team. Uh, having watched most of the games, I'd say that we're still giving a high amount of shots to the other team, despite most games out shooting. Right. And, uh, you know... I'm just going to transition into the state of whatever the fuck's going on with them because yeah. they somehow start the season uh, either 3-0 and or whatever. Yep. It looked real strong. Mm-hmm. And the mentality that Sullivan, the coach, had was we're going to score the dirty goals and that's how we're going to maintain offense, which is you know how I envision that – I mean, that's how they won back-to-back cups. Right. Uh, sure, the group around it, that philosophy is older. But at the same time, that kind of play never really is uh, contingent on age. It's about, you know, just blistering something at the net. Right. And so I don't think that they sustained actually attacking in that way. They revert, whatever reason, for whatever reason, I don't know if it it has to be the players in the locker room because it's got to this has gone on for almost ten years now. Uh-huh. They find this system that works, right, and then immediately run away from it, right. And that's also on top of the fact that they value offensive defensemen way too much. Mike Matheson was the one that they brought in to be an offensive defenseman because when Latang wasn't on the ice, they got rid of him this year. And now it's Jeff Petrie and P.O. Joseph on the second and third. And these are wonderful things when they work, but when you need stay at home defensemen who are going to block shots and do things like you say the Devils are good at, which is to increase the margin of shots that you generate and minimize shots that are attempted by the other team. Right. The Penguins don't have it. And on top of it, I hate to give credit to local sports radio because they lean so conservatively and don't even try to hide politics. But the one thing that they are right on is 
Jari and DeSmith, statistically speaking, are, well, around midweek this week, were 29th and 30th in goaltending uh, lead metrics, which Ooh. is, I mean, kudos to them for not being dead last among starters, but they basically are. And the unfortunate thing is now you've brought back Malkin, you've brought back Latang, and these are nice things. Jeff Carter is around for, I think, another two years. Petrie is not on a cheap deal himself. Brian Rust got a six-year deal, I want to say. So all these pieces that basically say we're going to try to build everything around decent but not great goaltending, and you know as well as I do, goaltending doesn't really become available in form no. of a dominant player during the trade deadline because dominant goaltenders ensure wins, and those teams aren't looking to sell. So but they also command a lot of they, money. They do. But if there's a guy on, you know, on a rental mm -hmm. last year of his contract, then you know as well as I do, a team like Pittsburgh has shown, and especially now that they've committed financial resources to saying that we're keeping the band together, they'll probably ship off that future again. But there will be no goaltender that provides a substantial boost. Yeah. The sure. fact of the matter that Flurry has been rumored for over two years as a potential reunion piece, and Flurry <laughs> is 38 years old, I want to say, Please, no. <laughs> just to show how bad the goaltending was, that the fans would rather an almost 40-year-old goaltender come back. Yeah, that's so bad. Now, what? Granted, Brian Burke was not going to do that. No. And Minnesota eventually got him. Mm -hmm. And Minnesota kept him. But yeah. you're not going to get better. So, I mean, uh, thanks I for Marino. Um, yeah, uh, look... Uh, again, Marino and Matheson are on big contracts because Jim Rutherford loved, and I mean loved giving guys that he just acquired a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yes, Marino was a rookie that came up through the ranks. Matheson was already on a bad contract in when they brought him in from Florida. Ooh. Marcus Pedersen was basically a fringe guy who hadn't cracked Vancouver's NHL yep. roster for a, a, for a regular basis. And he was a third-pairing defenseman when Rutherford brought him into the Penguins. And yes, we're talking years ago now. And Rutherford gave him, I think, a four- or five-year extension, like 20 yep. games in. And mm -hmm. so... It was more of this, we don't have a lot of young guys and we have to keep these young guys around to solidify the core that's getting older. The problem is you then overpay the young guys as if they were worth even half of what the core was making. Yep. So yeah, these, these third-pairing defensemen are now making two and a half, three million a year, which is not what a third-pairing defenseman should make. Nope. Uh, under the salary cap limitations that there are, I wish it was like the NBA and a third pairing defenseman could make nine million a year, but that's not how the revenue streams of hockey work. Nope. So now there's no room. You have said the next four years, we're going for it, and like, I don't I'm know. I'm sorry, but like you're going for it and being in the metro. It's already Metro's so tight, tight, right? The Metro is always going to be tough. And look, it, it things have a way of leveling themselves out. You know as well as I do that the Penguins are not going to lose 16 straight games. No. They do have enough talents to where a six-game losing streak in itself that has already happened probably is an anomaly yeah. and will not stand that long. But also, However, like, the, the point is that, like, the Metro is so tough that, like, you're, you need to be exceptional to make it in the Metro. 
because all teams are so close together. Well, aside from Columbus in this case, even Pittsburgh mm-hmm. is close with the rest of the pack. Like, and the funny thing about that, this all is, they were top three last year and yeah. brought everybody back. Yeah. Aside from those pieces that they traded away, they gave Sullivan a five-year extension, which basically says we can't do the whole Terrian. You know, we're going to fire the guy with a poor start thing because we just invested a, yep. a big contract for five more years. Yep. And so there is no way of saying to the public that a change can't be made. You've invested so heavily that you're kind of screwed. This is kind of like it, it reminds me of what the Blackhawks are going through, but maybe at a slower pace. True. The Blackhawks kind of just got there. Yep. It, it didn't was take long. One day the and Penguins, then one day. Penguins, you know, depending on how the season goes, it could get there. But my point is, with the way that teams are playing right now in the Metro, I would not be surprised if Washington or Pittsburgh is not in the playoffs. Oh, yeah, I would still be surprised if both of them. It, it I said one of them. One if of them, one of them don't make the playoffs, I'm not surprised. I understand, but they both still have the talent outside of goaltending that, yeah. ensure, that should get you into the playoffs. And I can say Malkin, you know, is, you know, Jekyll and Hyde. You never know what form you're going to get. And Latang is still as injury prone as he's ever been. But the fact of the matter is Crosby is a talent that doesn't statistically slow down that much. Yeah. But my point is that, like, okay, the Devils are probably playing above how they will be playing for the rest of the season, but they can make the playoffs. The Rangers, Carolina, they can make the playoffs. They are what they are, though. Those yeah. are teams that are expected to be at that era of yeah. their uh, of And their then the Islanders, they're surprising everybody right now. Right, and I don't expect that to last. But, uh, sure, they could probably eke out the wild card spot, I, I think. I don't think that there's anything in front of Sorokin to really be happy about, but... No, but Sorokin is just playing well. Right, and that's all you really need when you're actually in the playoffs. Right. And then, like, you have Philly, Washington, Pittsburgh, and Columbus. Mm -hmm. Columbus, I think, is just, like, done for the season. Like, don't even try. (laughs) Yeah. And it's only been 11 games, or whatever. (laughs) So... You have those three teams. I don't expect Philly to make it. But realistically, though one of Pittsburgh and Washington should pass the Islanders. But then will they... They basically both need to pass the Islanders and then one of them... uh, Both of them need to pass either, you know, New Jersey, New York, Carolina. So, what... I I can I can see a time where we don't have one of them in the playoffs. I I don't know. And it'll be a first, I think, for or at least like in recent history, I know that one of them have always been there, if not both. So it would be a, a weird playoffs, I think. Mm-hmm. I think it would be weird just if they both um both Pittsburgh and Washington, or even if only one of them didn't make the playoffs, just based on the past 15 years alone. Right, but like if we're looking right now, Devils are playing out of their mind. Even if they slow down, I like it's realistic for them to make the playoffs, right? Rangers and Carolina, they're both doing pretty well. I don't think they're playing out of their mind, but I don't think they are playing. You know, it's not like they're gonna just get like instantly, infinitely worse overnight. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Ottawa is for sale, apparently, um, but you cannot move the team. Uh, so that happened. Yeah, but the owner of, of Ottawa was like an absolute tragedy. Like, he, he actually s- sat, like, I watched a video a couple weeks ago where in the past six years, I don't know which year it was, he actually sat with fans 
and told the fans that the team yep. was basically crap and not to expect anything. Yeah, he's done that. He's that, yeah. your owner. <laughs> I mean, uh, not you. for transparency, I wish that the Pirates owner would just be like, they were crap. I wish I could tell you it was going to be better, but we'll see you when we see you. Don't even come to the game. Oh, no, he, the guy still is like, come to the games, you know? I want to make them not crap or whatever, but no. And to say that in Canada. Yeah. Which is like, we know for a fact that hockey players in themselves have said that going to Toronto and Canadian markets is just a completely different animal than anywhere, even yeah. like the cities near the border, like Buffalo or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So to actually say that to a Canadian fan base directly... Why would you have any support? <laughs> no, he doesn't. Uh, nobody. Uh, they, they have like Ottawa has been in a bad place because like, or at least the fans have they, uh, bought billboards telling him this. The, yeah, they accidentally made the conference finals, <laughs> which put them in a place where they basically had to try to run it back. Yeah, and then the real talent of them showed, and then the wheels fell off. Yeah. They sold everybody off, like Pajot and stuff like that, and they acquired draft picks. Those guys haven't panned out outside of uh, Kachuk. Yep. And so, I mean, kudos to Kachuk is the only thing I can say. Because didn't he sign a big, year to st uh, big deal to stay? I don't remember. Captain? I could be wrong. Yeah. All right, well, uh, any other team you want to talk about? No, no, I got everything off my chest. All right. So, so yeah, now we, now we talk about Phil. Phil's... A little something about Phil. <laughs> Iron Man streak, which yes, the because of American hero, <laughs> because of how it is, we also have to talk about Yandel. Yeah. So I mean, so I, we know this uh, past week, Kessel uh, has broken the Iron Man streak that was set only last year by Keith Yandel. Um, the difference with this being, we know that Kessel was going to eventually break it regardless. Yandel has since retired. However, it was uh, a sense of disagreement and uproar with the Flyers players last year where Yandel was playing because Yandel was a healthy scratch with about, I think we established somewhere between 15 and 20 games left in the season. Yeah, and... That's how his streak ended. Not not for what an Iron Man really is. It's like, you know, injury, like no injuries and just constantly there. It, it was ended by a scratch. It was healthy. Yeah. Yes. And so this is more an assessment of the timing of, these, of this Iron Man streak because it was probably something more destined to, if morally played out correctly... Happen closer to the All Star break, but also not, I not thought very close. But when when Yandel was still playing, I was like, he can reach a thousand games. I I fully oh, yeah. thought that, and then to hear that he's healthy scratched, I was just kind of shocked, right? So mm -hmm. while I think that Kessel would have overtaken Yandel, um, eventually, but we established that he would have like if Yandel played through the end of the season, he would have got a thousand games. Oh, yeah. Which in, that in itself would have been more. Yeah, and I I think that regardless of who's been the longest active Iron Man, getting a thousand games would have been like just a major accomplishment. And also, we have to discuss the fact that Philadelphia was already a crapshoot out of the playoffs. Yeah, I think they had like at that uh, point last year. So why not root for the individual accolades? Why would you? Still yeah, do I, the I think they literally that? had like a two percent chance to make the playoffs at that time. It, so it, made, it made no sense. Now, you can make the argument because Kessel's on a one-year, two, or 1.5 or two and a point five million dollar deal that Kessel is in the twilight of his career and, you know, there mm -hmm. is no guarantee that he was actually going to be guaranteed a roster spot if not for the late signing that did take place. True. Um, but at the same time... I don't know. I think Kessel, like, he. I think he still has a spot in the league. Yeah. 
So uh, it, I feel like that point's a little argument. moot because that I still think he has a spot in the league, whether it was with Vegas this year, right? Mm-hmm. Or any, like, literally any other team. Like, freaking Seattle could have signed him for one year, $1 million. He still has a spot in the league. True. Uh, although he, we don't know what Kessel's, um, what his ambitions were at this point after, what, three years in Arizona? Yeah. It's kind of hard when you finally have the chance to go pursue your options to settle for teams that are not going to contend. Um, Now, I will say that the other side of things is Kessel probably breaks this streak way sooner if not for the cancer diagnosis in Boston. Right. I do agree. Um, It's just like, I I don't know, because it and I think so hopefully and I think Kessel should be the the first and one over a thousand game. And I really think that even like once you eclipse a thousand games, I, I don't really think like it's about the next person eclipsing you like hitting a thousand games for any other player coming up who will do another Iron Man would probably be like that milestone. Because at some point, it's not, it, it, it's no longer how good you are. It's literally, can you just keep showing up on the ice? Like, can you be Yarmer Yager without taking breaks by going overseas? So, yeah. But I, I do think, like, every time we look back at Kessel, it's like, oh, well, Yandels was just kind of unceremoniously dropped. And it kind of is like a unnecessary black stain on it, but unfortunate because of the timing and the closeness between both of them, you know, getting to their numbers. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I, you know, it's weird is that he obviously in terms of talent is not close to Yager, but mm-hmm. Yager essentially kept playing for as long as he did because he admitted that he couldn't stop eating muffins. Like yeah. He was like, I, I I love muffins and carbs too much, so I, I need the exercise. <laughs> yeah. And it, it really, like, Hessel, I mean, if you look at him without the jersey on, he, if he stopped playing, he... He likes I mean, those hot dogs, I, man. I know that part of it was, like, his face probably was um, a reaction to cancer medication. Mm-hmm. But... The rest of it, there's no denying that, man. That that was he, not. He likes that. his hot dogs, man. He, he's eating protein. He's eating meat. <laughs> he's eating red meat, and he's having a good time with it. Yeah. So. He's still one of the fastest skaters in actual gameplay for a long time. Yep. All right. On to something that happened recently. I think it was two nights, uh, a couple days ago. We had. I think uh, at this point, it's five days. Huh. Yeah, probably. But yeah, it was Toronto at uh, Anaheim. So um, there was this pretty heated discussion going on everywhere where basically you had the same thing happen twice on different goal calls, right? In one of them, even though they stopped a scoring chance, it was called as a power play, right? The other one was given a penalty shot. So the whole point is, how do you, they literally looked exactly the same, right? The stick wrapping around and holding the other stick from making a shot. How do the officials make two drastically different calls on two such equivalent breakaways? And, you know, the, the good news of this was that neither one of these breakaways resulted in anything um right but it was a lot more stressful for you know like giving a two minute power play for what that's that's stressful for toronto it was a scoring chance (laughs) true although i I would this is one of those toss-ups where it's more like would you rather have the two minute power play and have potentially a chance at endless shots 
at the goaltender or do you ensure yourself the most quality shot with a pe- with a penalty but the, shot? The point is that regardless of the actual outcome, they should have been the same due to how equivalent they were. Mm-hmm. And it's not like the teams could have chosen that they wanted what they got. They just kind of got it, correct? Mm-hmm. So that was just, it was mind-boggling when I was watching this game and I saw that and then I, because I, I tuned into it when the first one had already happened. And so then, uh, like, I saw people online that were just like, what the hell is this? This exactly happened before. So I had to go look at it. And then there was a GI call also. Or... Goaltender interference at the uh, yeah. end of the third period. Yeah, and I'm I'm speechless, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that one was interesting because watching it back, I don't understand how you can call goaltender interference. Yeah. The shot was so wide that it deflected off of uh, Leafs defenseman who was technically like out like outside the main part of the crease yep. went off his foot or skate. I don't remember which one and then went in. Yep. Like that's a level of unpredictability that I don't understand how you can utilize replay and say that the goaltender would have had a chance to stop something that like, if the goaltender has to go from corner to corner of the uh, goalposts, or goalpost to goalpost, it already is extremely hard for them to do. Then add the fact that their own teammate is putting the go- the goal into play. Um, right. I think it's hard to say goaltender interference, and I know this is maybe a little controversial. Can you actually say goaltender interference happens when the goal is resulted by your own team? Um. So it's not about how the goals resulted. It's about how uh, another player on the opposing team is preventing a reasonable chance for the goalie to save it. And I will say the du- there was a Ducks player and a Leafs player kind of jostling in front of the goaltender. Right. But that Leafs player who was jostling was not the Leafs player where the puck went in. That was a second Leafs player. Right. <laughs> oh. Yes, that's interference, but it's technically interference on both sides. Yeah, well, I don't know. I was kind of, like, speechless at that. Like, I just think these three instances are pretty egregious. In uh, the the two, the one penalty shot, the one power play being so, you know, called differently, even though being basically exactly the same, is a pretty egregious thing for officials to mess up, especially when they have... They can look at it, right? Especially when it, there's multiple instances of it in one game. Right. You literally have the blueprint to call it... The uh, same way. I don't care if you call the penalty shot or the uh, right. two minutes. Do, Just call the same thing. Do, yeah. Yep. And it, I think that there has been a number of instances in, of disallowed goals probably being higher than average in the NHL so far this year. But also, like, this is the first time, I think, that we've had, like, more than one kind of egregious officiating moment in one game. Mm -hmm. Which is why I wanted to bring it up. Yeah, this is one of those things where I think it's controversial because of how it was handled. That Mm -hmm. being said, it's one of those instances where early in the season, when you have, just like in the NFL... When there's more pass interference calls earlier in the season and there's more roughing the passer until the players understand what they can and cannot do. And then eventually when you see a reduction in it. It's a combination of them being looser and players understanding boundaries more. Right. But at the end of the day, if there are instances where the referee calls the same thing or calls or having to be made on two very similar instances in the same game you still it just like football how can you call one thing roughing the passer and the other thing not yes exactly so all right on to some football so we have in the afc we'll start with the afc right so buffalo's on top followed by the jets miami and new england um 
any comment on any of those teams? Um, I'm, I don't really think. I think Buffalo was the clear favorite. I don't really think anything else is super surprising yeah, on that. And, and Buffalo's played like they're the clear favorite. Yeah. Then in I the think. north, we have Baltimore, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. So I'm sorry, but the two sports we've talked about don't really look so good for you. But I do think the teams are different, so you shouldn't see the hockey one that low in the standings. But <laughs> oh no, I saw the season coming. In yeah, fact, no. I, I, I apparently am one of the few realistic Steelers fans who saw this coming. This, like the Steelers, I think I I, I kind of saw them being this low. But I'm saying the hockey Pittsburgh for hockey shouldn't be that low in theory. Right, but the the hope for the hockey is is that there's a about 70 more games <laughs> yeah whereas the you got 10 basically like you got 10 you know, games let's beat the dead horse and see if it has a pulse yep um no but like i, I knew early on i mean it was trubisky at quarterback and i knew eventually it was going to be Pickett, and at that point it's the over. season was probably going to be lost and now i look forward to the steelers games for the reason of i want to see Pickett do well that's the only thing I care about right now. I expect them to lose, but I want to be excited by plays he makes and to, you know, talk to my father and stuff like that during Steelers games and be like, he threw a nice touchdown there. He threw a good ball. He's not making a lot of mistakes. I'm looking for optimism in this sole area. That's it. Fair enough. Um. So- yeah. All right. On to the south, we have Tennessee, Indianapolis, Jacksonville, and Houston. With also this having the only tie so far in the NFL, which I feel like ties are quite rare, but not like super rare. Speaking of beating a dead horse, the fact that Indianapolis probably still thinks that they have a chance <laughs> is very bad. They, like they they shut the, Matt Ryan down as a starter for the rest of the year, yep. which probably was to be expected yep um but uh, this is one of those things where tennessee is probably benefiting from being in a bad division because yeah brian Tannehill has told us with his play that he once the playoffs come around is not going to be the guy who leads any second half comeback or anything like that what they are is what they are if malik willis is going to play a majority of games because Tannehill is now hurt, then what do you expect him to do in the playoffs? Because for yeah. sure you're not going to open up all the doors and give him the key to the complete offense in the playoffs. Right. So I hate to say Tennessee probably has a really but- good defense, probably has a really good running game, and they are exactly what they have been. Yeah, but the the point is that they they are benefiting from their division being so bad, which is. Right. But I which mean that, that's how it works. That every year. Yeah. All right, and then finally, last division in the AFC, we have Kansas City, L.A., Denver, and Las Vegas. I it, not really it's surprised. really funny how bad Russell Wilson is now. Yep. Uh, it's really bad. Like the fact that the Steelers only just this past weekend became the lowest scoring offense. In football, that's yep. how bad Denver was. Was it took additional weeks for an inept offense in Pittsburgh to catch up? <laughs> yeah. All right. Finally, the NFC. We have Philadelphia, Dallas, New York, and Washington. Uh, New York Philly's is surprising real. all of us. Six and two. Um, everything else is kind of expected. This is and this is classic NFC East. There either is a handful of great teams because, yeah, I'm going to say the Giants' defense and their offensive line seem to – those things seem to have been fixed. I, I think they're clicking. I don't know if you can call it fixed, man. Well, I do clicking. think that they, they have the right pieces to sure. interchange things and still be successful. Sure. But Dallas and Philadelphia are both very good. Yeah. Um, and that's, this, is, this is how it works when the NFC East is good. There's still that one stink team, but everybody else is in contention. Um, and Philadelphia is probably the most legitimate team in the yeah. NFC. Mm-hmm. Um, I would agree. Uh, I'm still looking at the NFC North, where Minnesota's number one. 
and the fact that they added Hawkinson, these are all great things that don't mean anything. Until, when but also, awesome. like, they, I do really think they also are kind of like a Tennessee situation where they're also benefiting from the rest of their division just not showing up. They're benefiting from the rest of their division not showing up because it's out of nowhere. I, I, yeah, we, but look. they're not showing up, which is that why I say it's, I didn't say it was the rest of their division being bad. I'm just saying they're not showing up because it's out of nowhere. True. But, like, we've seen the script be written for Rodgers to succeed despite the fact that they don't draft a wide receiver in the first round or go mm -hmm. out and get a splash free agency wide receiver. Mm -hmm. That has never uh, deterred them from being successful in the past. Right. And their defense is not bad still. Uh, sure. It's just another year older. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, Rodgers now looks bad. And we, we knew last year, Rodgers was playing very well, probably in spite of the franchise he was attached to. Mm -hmm. But then it signs an extension to stay, and um, now it does not look like he's capable. And part of that's probably on in inexperienced receivers, uh, but part of right. it is just as much on the fact that Rodgers doesn't seem to have all of his fastball anymore. Right. Um, okay, finally, the South. We have Atlanta, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, Carolina. All of them are bad. What's new? Well, it is a little new because it, it, we found out what really makes Brady stink. Yeah, I mean, I, I think line Tampa is personal. the only kind of surprise there. Yeah, a bad offensive line in literally an absolute catastrophe of a personal life is what it what it took for Brady to be brought down to being a human again. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. And uh, West has Seattle, San Francisco, LA, and Arizona, which are all actually pretty close together. They're all pretty close together, which really makes the Geno Smith storyline not deserve all the recognition it needs because yeah. the fact of the matter that you guys had this guy start in place of eli manning at the end of his year uh career imagine what could have been if you never had to draft danny dimes <laughs> oh you guys would have had an additional three years <laughs> great all right um, on to the NBA, where we have some Brooklyn Nets. The, the absolute shit show that is the Nets. It's it's really bad. Um, and, I mean, we've seen the drama for a couple of years now, but we, I have no way... You want to no know something? I, I saw this on uh, Reddit or something. It's like, all of this is happening... And the one thing is, Steve Nash managed to escape. No, he didn't get fired. He escaped this shit show <laughs> by getting yeah. fired. Yeah. It was probably the best thing to happen for him. Yeah. The, the, you know, it, and it probably all starts with Steve Nash's hiring, to be honest with you. Because what do, like, it, it was so stupid of the Nets because... When they hired Jason Kidd to yep. be their coach and had Joe Johnson, Paul Pierce, right. all these guys, like Kevin Garnett, it was like, what do you expect them to listen to a guy who was their peer and competitor only months ago? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. And so they did the same fucking thing with Steve Nash. Yeah. Steve Nash has been... I mean, yeah, he kind of has been away from the game since, like, 2016. But Steve Nash will always kind of be a player in the mind of guys who are currently playing. Or have right. been in the league for 10 years. I mean, so, also, like, uh, okay, but at the same time, Steve Nash escaped this, which is good on him. The, the point is that, like, the Nets are finally doing something, mostly because the rest of the NBA and the world is tired of the Nets not acting and Kyrie not at least issuing some type of statement. Well, look, look, we have to do the, I know we talked a lot of hockey and it's probably going to push this a little long, but we have to do the due diligence on the Nets. Um, they hire Steve Nash, which isn't well received at, 
uh, in itself. Um, and this is after Kyrie and Durant have been there for a couple years, both of them with injury-prone uh, starts that allow them to sit on uh, and not play for a long time. And they're finally together, and they decide it, they have to have James Harden. The right. only way this works is we have to have James Harden. So James Harden comes along, and then Kyrie decides COVID vaccination is not for me. So I'm not going to play. Mm -hmm. So then James Harden, new to the scene, James Harden says, you know, I don't like this scenario, but I'll, I'll, I'll live with it. You know, it's better than what was going on in Houston. And then a year later, they're not even a year later, Harden is now saying, I'm hurt. Um, I don't want to play. This is not – yep. kudos to Harden because as much as a stripper-loving fuckhead is in the wrong for a lot of other reasons in life, he was guaranteed a scenario that was not what – He got was put in front of him. Yeah. And he said, I came here under the pretense that, you know, I could have gone to Philadelphia and played with Embiid and Ben Simmons would have gone to Houston or something, but I came here. Yeah. So then it's like, okay, so now Kyrie's still being a fuckhead. He doesn't want to play because of the COVID thing, he's a, a part-time player, which is always what you want to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on is part-time play. Um, so now we have to get rid of Harden because he's basically opting not to play. Harden goes to Philadelphia. Ben Simmons comes back. Yes, they probably get some draft capital, which will be okay at best because Philly's now in a competitive window for the next few years. So we're talking first-round picks probably are in the late 20s. Mm -hmm. Um, and Ben Simmons doesn't want to play. Ben Simmons still has anxiety from Billy Hate and the fact that he can't shoot a ball to save his fucking life. So Ben Simmons is out, and then Ben Simmons decides that he's going to come back starting this year. Ben Simmons now has a knee problem, despite the fact he had a full year and a half, basically, of no play. But now it was probably problem. no play plus not working out as he would. Correct. But we have to flash back and say, well, over the summer, Durant said, it's Nash or me. Um, and the Nets said, well, we're not getting rid of Nash. So now... Durant wants to go to Phoenix, or he wants to go to Miami. And it takes several efforts from Nets ownership to kind of settle things down and say, look, we have pieces here, we can still work things out. And because Durant is basically choosing his own deal, and the Nets are kind of in a situation where they're not going to get a lot back from whatever team Durant waives his no-movement clause for. Yep. The Nets to say, don't play them. We don't have to trade you. Um, so Durant is like, fine. You know, at least I'm not going to Sacramento or something like that. Um, so then the season starts. And now it, this is the best situation for Steve Nash. Mm -hmm. Because... You've had, as a head coach, to deal with drama for now two years. Yep. And then what follows is your player who has already opted to basically be part-time and show that he does not care, despite the fact he's from New Jersey, grew up as a Nets fan, has decided that... He has given more effort when he was with the Cavaliers. He has given more effort and dedication when he was with the Celtics. He has decided to screw over his hometown team and his childhood dream of playing with the Nets to the extent where he is in Brooklyn. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because you've been in New Jersey and New York longer than I have at this point. And I, I don't know New York City as well as I did New Jersey, 
but New York City and Brooklyn have Jewish communities that are somewhat yes. known compared to other uh, parts of this country. You like, can know communities for every, every like, you know, thing. And yes, like, they he literally has to go meet with the, basically the Nets are like, yeah, if you don't go meet with the parish leaders of the Brooklyn Jewish uh, community, Irish, we're... Yes. Yeah. If the, if, now we're at the point where if Kyrie... Okay, no, we have to go back a little further. Kyrie tweets out this link, a book turned documentary about uh, how America has to wake up uh, Hebrews, Hebrews to ne Negroes and how America needs to wake up and kind of realize that I didn't watch a documentary, read any excerpts of the books, but what it sounds like is it's basically more or less okay. a publication but that also, suggests that I don't, the Jewish people are in the wrong. But I, also, I don't care what, like, the, the fact that you are a public person, right? So, mm -hmm. regardless of what you think, you are subject to the court of public opinion. So Right. And for him to say he was not promoting something by putting it on his Twitter is ridiculous. So, then he decides, and I'm sorry to interject you, but I have to, like, put the timeline in place. For him to then say he's not promoting it, he's not going to issue an apology... And this fucking flat earther and anti-vaxxer to again stand on his his beliefs so much so at a time when Kanye West is saying that Kyrie Irving is the only other person in the world who's a real person. Despite the fact that Kanye West has just been dismissed from basically all of his business ventures for siding with anti-Semitism. As no, even if Kyrie doesn't post this on his Twitter, he's already being linked to anti-Semitism. It should probably disavow. But it. it's Kyrie easier. Irving decides to double down and so, say, "I can't be anti-Semitic if I know who I am as a person who is what not Jewish." But the point is that if if this stopped at him being linked by Kanye and he didn't actually post anything. That would further this anti-Semitic thing, right? It right, would be a lot time, easier on everybody. It's a lot easier because, yes, and I hate to say this as the rationale, but Kanye's a fucking crazy person. We know this. He does crazy-ass shit that, for whatever reason, people decide to follow his lead on. No. And the fact of the matter is, at that point in time, Kyrie Irving had said nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to say because of the person that Kanye West is because, you know, Kanye West also said Stephen A. Smith was in that same conversation. And has anybody dragged Stephen A. Smith's feet? No, because Stephen A. Smith didn't fucking do some dumb shit following it and then fucking double down. Kyrie Irving chooses to double down despite the fact he is in a community where... Jewish deli is a common phrase in the New York market. And the fact of the matter is then triple down by saying that he's not going to do anything. So now we are at the point where... So the, he's basically been fined uh, $1.2 million. Uh, but yeah, that's about... He suspended... At a minimum. A, at minimum five games. So he's been fined $1.2 million at a minimum, basically. Right. And this suspension, what, came yesterday? Yesterday. Late, and then today, you know, obviously... He finally issued something, finally. After, after, after the Nets owner emails uh, Kyrie Irving's agent and says, if these steps aren't done, you're not playing for us anymore. The steps of but also, meeting the, with... What's even worse is that... For him, for Kyrie, right? He's on the last year of his deal, If correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. So, he's already, like, all of this has basically tanked him so worthless that the, the Nets literally have no 
stock in him. They will just leave him on the side. So he can't even play if he wants to at this point. Like right. Because the Nets are now saying, we are bad. We started the season bad. Things on this trajectory are not improving. So if we punt on the season, so be it. Mm-hmm. What's it to us? Right. Because it what Durant already wanted out. So what's... Right. What is it to us if he wants out next year? Um, but getting back to it, it, it's basically on the condition of Kyrie has to meet with Jewish leaders in the community and learn things and go to counseling. And he had to issue an apology. And only four hours after this email goes to the agent is an apology issued. But nobody take nobody Fact believes of the it. Matter, right. I, I wouldn't believe it either. Because yesterday, when he had the choice in the matter, he declined. Mm-hmm. Only at the stake of his money that was going to come in did he apologize. Right. Which I and now at this point, the next GM says it's a step in the right direction he apologized. No, no. I'm gonna tell you it's not. Because it's very well, clear okay, when you so read hold the on. Timeline, There's also this, right? Like, mean I ag- everybody's going to agree with you, but if the Nets don't say something like that, because he actually did something that he was supposed to in this situation to keep playing, if the Nets don't issue that type of statement, this goes in a completely different direction. So they well, have to say it's a step in the right direction, but not enough. Well, but even if it, we, even if we know that that's a complete fallacy. If they don't issue that type of statement, there's another problem. Anyway, okay, but uh, I'm going to say this, and yes, the Nets operate in in their response with a PR component in mind. However, we're talking about a 30 year old man here who had the wherewithal to tweet out this stuff. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. The... I, I need to get this point finished. We can't baby a guy who has already said that he's going to take every uh, opportunity to not care as he did with COVID vaccination, right. as he did with but, other things, as he did with lying to the Celtics fans in front of their face about re-signing. At some point, PR is PR. And apparently Kyrie has been entitled enough in his life to where PR moves shouldn't be the response. In my opinion, the response should be, that's great. We told but you to the, apologize. The point and is, I don't believe you have to you look at it show me. that you can't just. So it's not PR because of Kyrie Irving. It's PR that the Nets have to do because right. of it's what because they stated beforehand, right? Right. So I think them saying that is a moot point. We all understand why they have to say it, but nobody's going to take it with a grain of salt. We get it. Yeah. Okay. And. We'll see what Kyrie does in the coming days slash weeks, but uh, let's move on. Well, let's move on partly because the Nets who have done all these stupid things, like it's not, oh, woe is me, Nets, because of the things that they did. They fucking are about to hire a coach who's suspended from Boston for having a scandal as their next head coach. The Nets... Literally, okay, that is another thing. The Nets have always just been, let's try to find somebody, I don't care, right? But this takes, like, Kyrie's situation takes it too far for them. But do do I think they care that he had a scandal? Do how, You have a PR division of your company for a reason. Right, but at the same time, if you're going to coddle the players and then say that they did something wrong, you either have to say, we're all in on coddling the players or we're all in on saying you did something wrong. You can't go back and forth. You coddled Durant back to playing for one more year. You coddled uh, Irving to say that, you know, he was still in your best interest despite the fact that he didn't side with the team for two years. And at some point, you have to say... Okay, enough's enough. We we have acted in the best interest of you, and you have not returned the favor. So Durant, every time you fuck up, we're not defending you. 
Uh, Kyrie, the, the every point time is, you fuck up, we're not defending you either. The point is, if they don't do that, it looks worse. Uh, uh, like they have to be, they have to fuck up. It works. It wor- looks but, worse as an organization. Yes, but the fact the, the point is, is, they only care about the organization, away. right? Like you can't like they are an organization. They care about how the organization looks. They have to f up so much that they can issue something as some type of punishment. Right? right, and that's but that stain what Kyrie's done. Will go away. That stain eventually will go away as time goes on. And but it doesn't matter. But they don't want to wait. Their, those players in their future, in their abil- inability to be accountable, will not go away. Yeah, but and why does the company the care money. about the the like again? The company doesn't necessarily care about how the players operate. Just that while they are a part of the team, they do certain things, right? Like, we as a whole are part of a court of public opinion, and we attempt to hold them accountable because it's what we want. They have a contract with an organization that states that they must do X, Y, and Z to get paid their big bucks, right? There's nothing about teaching them how to be accountable, teaching them what's right from wrong, None of that. As long as it doesn't adversely impact the organization too much, the organization doesn't really care. It should. But no organization cares. When I apply for jobs, I have to check a box that says I will operate in good faith on the organization. On the organization. Built into the contract of the player. Yeah, but... And if you're not operating in good faith... Then yeah, but the I thing know is, it's the NBA and there's a players association, but the contract should be able to be terminated. Right, but there's the they're basically a union, right? Right. That's the thing that stands in the way. The NFL, the union doesn't matter though. Yeah, but that happens. CBA. Aaron Hernandez is cut immediately. Yeah, but that that's collective bargaining, right? So their union, they haven't got that. But the point is that. The company looks out for its best interest. In this case, it's the Nets, right? So if you deviate way too much for its best interest, where it finally can reprimand you by suspending you for five games without pay, it will do it because it's in its best interest. It doesn't necessarily have to align itself with your best interest. Anyway, let's take a look at the Lakers. I'm assuming. Yeah. So my thing on the Lakers is uh, more of a media thing. We know what the Lakers are. We know that they're a shit show, and we know that they have very limited assets. Mm-hmm. That in the form of what twenty, twenty-seven, and twenty-nine first-round picks. Right. Um. They've made their bed. Have to lie in it, but yet for whatever reason, anybody of moderate. Uh, success in the NBA. We're not even talking uh, true starters. Uh, like a good sixth man is being linked to the Lakers. He needs to stop. You know, right now, the Lakers are in a position where getting rid of Russell Westbrook is their best play. Probably. And at that point, yes, they'll get cap room. They still have no assets. They probably are going to have to throw in picks to get rid of Russell Westbrook for a team to eat the dead contract yep. because he's making, what, $47 million this year? Um, so I'm tired of the Lakers being tied to anybody. Buddy Heald and Miles Turner should be traded to the Lakers. For what? For what? They literally have... Three undrafted guys on their bench. Right. Stop. Yep. The media loves to talk about where LeBron is. Well, unfortunately, LeBron built this shit show. And the fact of the matter is the GM of the Lakers is a former players agent who doesn't understand what assets are because he's only ever seen things from the side of, can I get my player paid? Right. So... Now he brought in all the players that have gotten paid. They can't perform. LeBron is, what, 37, 38 years old. Anthony Davis is basically in a gurney half the time. And what can you do now? 
Everybody else is on the veterans minimum. Right. All right. Well, so, I, I mean, I agree with you. I don't think I have anything more to say. But let's talk. I really wanted to get to this. So. We've talked a lot about several things. And now. Well, everybody's I mean, favorite, Gonzaga. Specifically a favorite, sarcasm, by the way, of is, my co-host to here is attempting to join the Big 12. It's like Gonzaga's trying to cancel me. Yeah. <laughs> they, they know I have this solid argument every year. That every year. You can give them whatever ranking, whatever seed you want, but until they are in a solid and quality conference... And putting up the numbers them. that they do on those years, it's not worth it. <laughs> But, I have a take. I have a take. Okay. So, now what we know is that Gonzaga has been in touch with the Big East, which they will never go to the Big East because it's basically like a step above whatever they're in now. But, like, the bottom half of the Big East is basically, like, going to get beaten by Gonzaga. I will give them that. Mm -hmm. um, the Pac-12, which... Historically speaking, Raleigh is our best play because Arizona and USC, there are always a handful of teams that will make the tournament and be good, but they're never really like ACC, Big Ten, Big 12 right. good. Um, so Pac-12 is normally the odd man out when it comes to college basketball in, in Power 5 form. Mm -hmm. uh, the Big 12 has Kansas, they have Baylor, they have West Virginia, which, you know, they're not in the most solidified air, um, arena right now of the Big 12, but historically, you know, is a very good program. Right. Um, Texas, Arkansas, or no, Arkansas is SEC, my apologies. Um, so, Big 12, or Texas Tech is Big 12 also. Um and then TCU's Big 12, TCU top 15 team this year going into. So the Big 12 has had a lot of success. The only thing is if Gonzaga joins the Big 12, one, it's a question of when. Yeah. Two, it's a question of what does that say about what Gonzaga has been historically? Uh, is uh, Gonzaga basically admitting that they were a decent team in a bad conference. You would have to say that for them to leave says they know. But I mean, they don't at have the same time. Team. It's not like they're it's trying like, to boost revenue. True. But like, I don't know. Crunched it's... Num somebody crunched the numbers under the new Big 12 media deal that would be coming if Gonzaga was added Basically, the revenue that comes in for each school in share is like $365,000 more. Mm -hmm. So, Gonzaga doesn't stand to gain a lot financially from this move. And neither does any other team but in the Big 12. From in Gonzaga theory, it just them. gives them more prestige for what division. It, it, it gives them more prestige when they enter. Yeah. But my take is it doesn't give them prestige because I'm sticking to my guns here in saying that once they are among top level competition in January and February and they have those losses, Gonzaga is now betting on themselves as they should have been all along mm -hmm. of saying, give us an eight or a nine seed and we'll still kick your ass in March mm -hmm. in April. But long gone will be the days of Gonzaga always being a top five team, which is fine. Let's call a spade a spade here. Gonzaga probably never was a top five team. True. They would, hey, look, any, we know what March Madness is. We know what college basketball storming the court is. Mm -hmm. Storming the court implies that a lower quality team beats a high-quality team. And it happens several times a year. 
So when in October, in November, in December, when you have these one-off games where Gonzaga plays a Duke or a Kansas, and then they never play a game of that quality again, it's basically a storm the court game. Because any team can hang with a high-quality opponent one time or two times in a season. Mm -hmm. That does not make, let's say, a Kansas State a top 25 team for being 11 and 15 at the end of the year and having two quality wins. It makes them an 11 and 15 team that has two quality wins that misses the tournament and will miss the NIT and they'll have no postseason. Right. So what we're now looking at is, is that what Gonzaga truly is? Well, recruiting may not change for a couple of years after they move to the Big 12, if they do. Um, but the environment that is Gonzaga does change. And if we can go to the next slide, Gonzaga only built their basketball stadium in 2004, which, yeah, newer stadiums have been built since state-of-the-art, whatever. Gonzaga does not have a football team. Gonzaga does not bring in a lot of revenue. Um and a lot of boosters for their athletics overall. So what Gonzaga has been selling their recruiting is an elite college basketball performance uh, mm -hmm. and an elite existence. And this is actually coming into my mind right this minute. It reminds me a lot of what Pitt and Syracuse were to the Big East before they moved to the ACC. Granted, the Big East was considered a power conference because they had these names and they had the competition. But do you think... But, I think that if they move to a Big 12, I think they can at least get a... I don't think the age of the stadium matters. I think they could get a bigger no, one. No, it's not the age. It's the fact that they don't have the boosters to build a new stadium so what they are is what they are for the next 15 to 20 years probably in terms of a stadium at the, at the very least if a booster comes along and says i'm going to pledge hundreds of millions for a new stadium we're still looking at what six years out yeah. of a stadium actually being built because we're but i think compared. i think it's not unreasonable to think they could get a booster but we're also saying it's a 6,000-seat stadium. Yeah. And we're going to look at the, the Kansas and the Texas. And, yes, there are small arenas in the Big 12. But, you know, TCU, who has the smallest in the Big 12 at its current standing, has a very good coach in Jamie Dixon who used to be at Pitt and was top 15 regularly when he was at Pitt. And... And up until last year, that program was not very good, despite the fact that they had a very good coach. So the draw was not there because it's a Big 12 program that can't piece together the same experience as a Kansas or even a Texas. You know, on a game day, they a Gonzaga can't pack the arena to the likes of Big 12. So now we're, we're going to say this five-star recruit is going to play in the Big 12 regardless of the team. Uh, is between K Kansas and Gonzaga, Kansas is absolutely going to win. Mm -hmm. Because what does it matter? They're playing the same opponents. What does it matter? The transfer portal is all the same. So it doesn't matter where you spend your first year. I can always go back to Gonzaga later if, if I'm a bum at Kansas, if I don't get enough playing time. But by then, the prestige has worn off. So... At this point, I do think talking. that if they're in the Big 12, I, I think when they first move, they'll get like a, uh, they probably will see some recruiting boost. Um, but I think yeah, it will initially. dwindle pretty quickly. I think exactly. That's my, um, my but they will is, see some. It will see some initially because it's a power play to join the conference and it's right. But when. Gonzaga turns from a 30-win team with two or three losses on the season to a 25-win team with 10 losses on the season, which is good enough for a 5-8 through eight seed, depending on the conference you're in. That'll change because Kansas has already solidified they dominate in this conference. Baylor has already solidified in the past 10 years 
they dominate in this conference. So, why would you choose the eight seed over the one or two seed? That's True. kind of where my take lies. And yeah. again, I, I see this working out the same way at Pitt in Syracuse and Louisville joining the ACC worked out. Pitt was a, a program of very high prestige and they moved to the ACC for their football program. That's something that Gonzaga can't say that they're doing because they don't have a football program right. worth a damn to salvage this move for. Now, Gonzaga is going to be like Pitt and enter a higher quality conference where you've got the UNCs, the Dukes, but in the Big 12. And all of a sudden, Pitt will make the, the tournament as they did when they were in the Big East for a handful of years because that's what Pitt did. They were an 8 or a 9 seed, maybe a 10 seed for the first two or three years they were in the ACC. What is Pitt now? The ACC's basement. Recruiting has become a nightmare. They've gone through a number of coaches. Their best recruit in years is, you know, got arrested a couple months ago. I'm not saying it's going to be like that for Gonzaga, but the fact of the matter is Mark Few was a very good coach in a very bad conference. Mm -hmm. Is Mark Few going to be the coach of Gonzaga for another 10 years if Gonzaga goes to the Big 12? Probably not. No. Eventually, the recruiting lust will go away. And just like the pit and stuff like that, they'll have the relevancy and they're, you know, ooh, we're the new school in the Big 12. It's cool to come here. And eventually that will wear off. And they'll eventually become, like, unlike Pitt, they'll probably become the Syracuse or the Louisville, which is the, the bubble team that gets hot at the right time. They'll make the tournament. They'll have a decent run. But you know that they're never going to win a championship. Just like I've been saying, they were never going to make the championship and win it as it stood. Fair. So they are going to be exactly what teams that left for higher quality to say that they were elite and failed have become. Fair. So Gonzaga will never be what Gonzaga is now if they leave. They know they have it best right now, but they know eventually people will stop calling or stop believing the bullshit. Right now, everybody believes it's regardless of conference, they recruit really well. They have a good coach. Well, I mean, it's shown over the past eight, nine years that when it really mattered, they weren't ready. And they won't be ready if they're playing San Francisco University, Santa Clara, twice a year. Like, they will never be ready. They'll always be close to ready, but never ready. All right. Well, that's uh, we have a long episode after our bit of a break, but I feel like we got a bunch of things off, huh? I'm tired, Chuck. <laughs> My voice is going to be hoarse. Good. Like this. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I got nothing else to say. Yo. Nope. All right, well, I'm sorry that it took a month to get another podcast out, despite the fact I'm unemployed. <laughs> yeah, life gets in the way, right? Anyway, thanks for tuning in, and catch you next time.